Today we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Mary Tonetti for talking about chronic conditions in older adults. Dr. Mary Tonetti is the Gladys Fellows Crowfoot Professor of Medicine and Epidemiology and Chief of Geriatrics at Yale School of Medicine. In her earlier work, she identified the causes, adverse consequences, and effective prevention of fall injuries in older adults and translated these findings into clinical and public health practice. Her current focus is on clinical decision making for older adults in the face of multiple health conditions, measuring the net benefit and harms of commonly used medications, and the importance of, the importance of cross disease universal health outcomes. She's also leading a national effort to develop a test, a model of healthcare that realigns primary and specialty care to focus on health outcome priorities and treatment preference of older adults with multiple and complex health needs. She has over 175 original publications and is a viewpoint writer for JAMA. Dr. Panetti received her undergraduate and medical degrees from the University of Michigan, and Dr. Panetti provides care for older adults at Yale New, New Haven Hospital. She's the recipient of numerous awards and served on several national advisory committees, including for the NIH, FDA, NQF, and NCQA. She's a member of the Institute of Medicine, a member of the Methodology Committee of the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, the CORI and is a MacArthur Foundation Fellow. She recently was an Atlantic Philanthropies Health and Aging Policy Fellow at CMS. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mary Knett. Uh, well, thank you. Um, it's very nice to be here, and uh, I applaud all of you for making it uh, through the snow. I, I only had a nice two-block walk, and so um, hopefully you all made it safely. Um, and it's very nice to be here to talk to you what I call the most common um, internal medicine health condition in the 21st century, namely multiple chronic conditions. And what my objectives with you today are, number one, to describe, which I probably don't have to tell you because you live it every day, some of the challenges and complexities involved in decision making and care for our older adults and really patients of all ages because we know that for all adults, multiple chronic condition is the most common condition. Um, but the complexities of, of decision making for these patients and to discuss some of the research and clinical changes that could help inform and improve decision making for this population. Um, at Yale, and I presume it's uh, common here also, is to start with uh, a patient. And uh, my patient is Mr. T. I have to admit that he's a conglomerate of many patients that I take care of and probably patients that you take care of. But probably is not a, uh, different from several of the people that you're caring for uh, today in the hospital. He's 83 years old, and he um, complains of fatigue, decreased appetite, and weakness. As you can see, he has a panoply of chronic conditions, including a prior MI, hypertension, uh, diabetes, heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, atrial fibrillation, um, peptic ulcer disease with a recent upper GI bleed and depression. And again, not an atypical assortment of conditions in our older adult patients. Um, he is cared for by um, cardiologists and endocrinologists and other specialists as well as primary care doc, all of whom follow state-of-the-art evidence-based medicine. He goes on Monday to his cardiologist um, who wants to increase his beta blocker and uh, warfarin and uh, diuretic, and says it's time to consider an AICD given his heart failure and his reduced ejection fraction. His endocrinologist is concerned about his hemoglobin A1C and wants to start uh, insulin and wants to continue bisphosphonate because concerned about his osteoporosis. His psychiatrist is convinced that his beta blocker is, is contributing to both his fatigue and his depression and would like to decrease it or stop it and consider another um, antihypertensive. His gastroenterologist thinks that his uh, warfarin was started too soon after his upper GI bleed. And on Friday, he goes, and this is Monday through Thursday, on Friday he goes to his PCP, who is, is measured on all of the preventive services and spends most of the visit kind of catching up on all of his preventive services. And thank goodness the next day is Saturday and he finally gets to rest. Um, the disease outcomes that all of these outstanding clinicians follow, including uh, improving his blood pressure, avoiding stroke, MI, fractures, rehospitalizations for heart failure, sun death, GI bleed, 
and they also want to improve his depression and renal function. So each clinician follows appropriate guidelines and follows appropriate disease-based uh, outcomes. So what's the problem in situation represented by patients like Mr. T? Um, and what we find is, although all of that care individually is really wonderful and state-of-the-art, in the aggregate, we know that older adults with multiple and complex conditions receive a lot of care. It's not a problem with access. The problem is this care, as reflected in, by Mr. T, is fragmented across clinicians and settings. Each clinician focuses on his or her own subset of conditions, often offering, as for Mr. T, conflicting uh, uh, advice. Many of the, this care may be of unclear benefit and potential harm and as I will show you is increasingly burdensome for the patients and importantly it's not always focused on what matters most to these patients. And just to walk you very briefly through the evidence that supports the, the, um, this, this care um, in work that my fam who is now at the um, CMMI at CMS uh, reported a few years ago in Annals uh, for the typical uh, patient with multiple chronic conditions, they see an average of seven physicians a year, again, each of whom focus on their individual conditions in addition to a panoply of other providers. But this fragmentation is not just for the patients, it's also incredibly fragmented for the clinicians. And she also found that the typical primary care clinician who, who cares for, for Medicare uh, beneficiaries has to interact with 229 distinct different providers each year. We cannot incentivize, we cannot penalize uh, enough to coordinate care. That is just absolutely impossible for anyone to try to coordinate their care no matter how much they, no matter how much they want to. But this care is not only fragmented, it's of uncertain benefit, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later as well. But we know in multiple different studies, and it's, it's getting perhaps a little bit better, but for the most part, older adults with multiple chronic conditions are excluded from the vast majority of clinical trials that inform evidence-based guidelines. Um, on, on the average, um, the randomized controlled trial participants are healthier and have fewer conditions than clinical populations, and this is um, including the recent uh, SPRINT trial, which I know has gotten a lot of publicity, and we we'll, may talk about that a little bit more. But it's of uncertain benefit for another reason, is because with multiple chronic condition, what is the outcome that defines benefit? If you have somebody like Mr. T, whose blood pressure gets better, but his depression gets worse, um, or um, we prevent a stroke, but we cause a massive bleed, what, how do we define benefit in individuals with multiple chronic conditions? And I think that's a major clinical um, uh, challenge. But this care may also be harmful um, in many different ways. As we know is that the adverse effects of medications, um, when, we, when we treat for one condition, um, the effect can be adverse on another condition. And we know that every time you increase another medication, you increase the risk of an adverse drug event by about 10%. So thinking about uh, your older patients in the hospital today, very few of them take less than 10 medications, right? So if they're at 10 medications, you pretty much have a 100% chance that they're having at least one adverse drug event. So when you go back to your units today and look at their drug list and think about which of the medication that may be causing that. But the other concern we have is the trade-offs across condition. Things may help one condition and worsen another. And that's um, a piece of work that I did with a, a medical student at Yale um, a couple of years ago and looked at the under-recognized source of harm in this population, what we call therapeutic competition, where there's trade-off across conditions. It's when we treat one condition by following guidelines, but we worsen another. And we sort of facetiously call this guideline recommended harms. So to look at the frequency, we looked at the Medicare current beneficiary uh, survey, which is a representative sample of older adults in the United States um, who uh, re receive their care from Medicare, which is obviously the vast majority. So we started almost 6,000 of these individuals, a completely representative clinical sample. And we looked at 26 classes of of guideline recommended medications that had the highest level 
of, of evidence uh, recommendation for 14 of our most common chronic conditions. And we asked the simple question is how often did a guideline recommended medication for one condition potentially harm another condition? And what we found, and we were quite surprised, is that of this representative sample, 36%, over a third, over one out of three of a representative sample of older adults received one a medication for one of their chronic conditions that potentially could be harmful for another. Again, we weren't able to look to see how often harm at, um, um, actually occurred, but these were, these were harms that are well recognized as being associated with the medications and for which there are at times at least relative contraindications. 20%, one out of five, received two medications, and over 10%, 12% 12, um, 12 had three or more medications that were pre prescribed following guidelines that could in injure one of their other conditions. So we became particularly interested in this concept of trade-off because I think it's one of the key issues and challenges in this care of older adults with multiple chronic conditions. Um, so we did a study a few years ago where we looked at one common uh, trade-off, hypertension versus serious fall injury. And we know that about a third, about one out of three older adults, has both hypertension and is at risk for falls and fall injuries. And I know the recent sprint trial suggested there's not an increased risk of serious fall injury with hypertensive therapy, and I'm certainly willing to discuss um, that if, if anybody is interested. But uh, in a study that we did, again, in a representative sample of older adults, we wanted to determine the effect of antihypertensive medications in older adults uh, with multiple chronic conditions on cardiovascular events, uh, serious injuries, uh, verse N and death. And again, we use the Medicare current beneficiary uh, population, about 5,000 individuals who had an average age of about 80 years. 66% had three, at least three other uh, common cr uh, chronic conditions. And this is about norm for a clinical population of older adults. So if you ever look at randomized controlled trials and you see older adults who have only a few chronic conditions, it's probably not a terribly representative sample. Um, the outcomes, again, that we were looking for were stroke, MI, and all-cause mortality, and serious fall injury. And we were, interested in it, we were interested in serious fall injuries that had a comparable morbidity and mortality as associated with strokes and MI. So it was, these were serious head injuries and fractures, including particularly hip fractures, so pretty comparable morbidity. Um, and basically what we found um, look, using propensity matching uh, and adjusting for a whole range of uh, factors that predispose individuals to be treated for hypertension as well as to be at risk for, for the outcomes. And what we found is that individuals who took one to two uh, uh, antihypertensive medications relative to those who didn't had about a 40% increase risk of serious fall injury and about a 21% reduction in cardiovascular event or all-cause mortality. For indiv interesting, in people who took three or more um, medications versus none had a, a comparable increased risk of serious fall injury by 28% and a decreased risk of cardiovascular event or mortality, all-cause mortality, about 28%. Really a direct trade-off. We also looked at, at hypertensive uh, intensity where we accounted for dosage as well as number of medications and results were quite comparable. So clearly evidence, um, obviously no one study is definitive, but pretty compelling evidence, a distinct trade-off in a representative clinical sample of older adults with multiple chronic conditions. So then we were interested in the question, okay, this trade-off occurs. What do older adults think about it? It's not very often that we ask older adults, if you're faced with this trade-off, what matters most to you? But this study suggests that perhaps we might want to start doing that. What we did, we found 125 older adults in the greater New Haven area who had both hypertension and were at uh, risk uh, for falling uh, for a whole range of reasons that I can, can answer for you if you're interested. And we presented them the trade-off using kind of state-of-the-art framing so it didn't look like we had bias for one for the other. And we asked them, um, given them the, the likelihood of benefit for one versus harm of the other, um, what was most important to them if they had to pick between the trade-off 
of serious fall injury versus particularly stroke. We use stroke because that really is the outcome that people are most concerned about with their hypertension. And we looked at their decrease, you know, presented them the information in terms of a decreased chance of stroke and MI versus increased chance of serious fall injury and adverse medication effect. And we were actually shocked with results because we really felt that the vast majority of people would, would put the priority on preventing strokes and MIs because there's so much publicity that's been given about the importance um, of, of preventing strokes and MI for, for obvious reasons, less attention to, um, to falls and injuries. But what we found almost exactly smack half prioritized avoiding strokes and MIs. They were willing to put up with the risk of injury and adverse medication effect to prevent strokes or MIs. And about half prioritize avoiding strokes or MIs, even if it meant it may increase the risk of strokes um, and uh, MIs. So again, almost an exact trade-off, which we were quite surprised at, and which is usually ignored. Frankly, even in my clinical practice, it's hard to know how to incorporate all of those trade-offs into decision making. But finally, the care might also be uh, burdensome. And um, this is an increasingly recognized issue in, uh, in clinical practice as we have more, a broader and broader armamentarium of medications and procedures uh, that help us um, take care of individual chronic diseases. It accumulates and particularly more and more as we're getting measured on how our patients do, we're putting more and more self-management tasks on our individuals. And um, on the left side of the slide, is some work, um, work uh, that uh, Cynthia Boyd at Harvard reported now almost 10 years ago in JAMA, looking at if you have to follow um, disease guidelines for nine common chronic conditions, what would your day be looking like? And the concept here is you can't read this, right? And if you can't read what's on this slide, you pretty much know your patient isn't going to be able to, to uh, follow it. So she was really one of the first people that started talking about the, the flip side of, of all the wonderful disease guideline uh, based care um, that we're doing and perhaps that they, we're getting into the area of burdensomeness. Uh, uh, Judy uh, Bynum, who is at Dartmouth and is working as part of the Dartmouth Health Atlas uh, projects, recently reported on, uh, again, work from older adults with multiple chronic conditions, looking at what she calls contact days. It's the number of days of the year that people spend in the hospital or in an ambulatory visit, getting a procedure, imaging, or laboratory tests. So it doesn't even count home care and self-management tasks. It's just the number of days that people are in contact with the health profession. And on average, it ranged from about 10.4 to, to 25 days um, with um, a sizable proportion spending about a third of their life uh, in contact with the health system. And again, showing, showing that, that the more we're able to do, the more burden we're putting on our patients. Uh, Victor Montori at uh, Mayo Clinic has been probably a leader in this concept of, of treatment burden. And in one of his recent articles, he quoted a patient that's saying, Doc, caring for my chronic condition has become just more burdensome to me than the conditions themselves. So this whole concept of care burden, treatment burden, is being increasingly recognized. Is what are people willing and able to do to get the health outcomes that, uh, that they're interested in. And with all of our interest in, uh, in adherence, there's an emerging amount of work that there's a pretty close relationship between how burdensome people think that their care is to how adherent they are to what we ask them to do. And so it's probably time to reframe um, poor adherence to um, excess treatment burden that we need to figure out and address. And, and finally, this care is not always aligned with what matters most to patients. So we're following these disease guidelines, and that's wonderful. But we have to remember that our patients really think in terms of personal life outcomes, not disease-specific outcomes. They care about their hemoglobin A1C because they don't want to lose their vision. They don't want to, need to, they don't want to go on dialysis. 
uh, et cetera. And so they, they don't think about disease-specific outcomes. And importantly, Dr. Fried and our group, but others have also shown this, that disease-specific outcomes may not always measure what matters most to individuals. And importantly, if you ask older adults, we think about mortality, number one, and we think about strokes and other disease-based outcomes. But patients themselves really vary. They're able to articulate, faced, faced with trade-offs, faced with what uh, my health conditions, people, what I find most important is different than what you find most important. They really vary in the health outcome goals that matter most to them. Um, they also matter, uh, uh, vary, as we said, in their care preferences uh, of what they're willing and able to do. So again, we're getting emerging amount of information of what patients find important, what matters most to them, um, that may be different from what we're doing with our disease-based care, and as we'll get to is hopefully there's a way to marry those two a little bit better than we have. And I think the good news here is um, in work that we did a few years ago, it's not quite as complicated um, as it might be because what we, this concept of universal health outcomes, these are the health outcome categories that matter most to individuals, but they're also the outcomes that most of our chronic diseases affect. And so in work that we did, again, looking at a representative sample of, of older adults in this country, and we just looked at the um, independent effect of, of these five common chronic conditions on function, symptom burden, and survival. And again, most of the individual health outcomes that people care about can be put in one of these three buckets. And as you can see that arthritis affects function to some extent, big effect on burden, not surprisingly no effect on survival, and again, as you can see, the results are exactly what you expect with COPD and heart failure being the major contributing factors to survival, um, and um, depression and COPD particularly affecting symptoms. So again, it may not be as difficult to make the leap from disease-specific outcomes to universal health outcomes when we think both about the evidence and the application of evidence to decision-making. So. So we wanted to ask is, do the findings that, that, um, that has been done on, on older adults with multiple chronic conditions in the last decade or so, does it suggest a path toward more appropriate care for older adults with multiple chronic conditions? And to try to answer these questions, we got support from the John A. Hartford Foundation, Robert Wood Johnson, and Pecori. Um, and with this, we were able to convene an advisory and working groups of patients, caregivers, primary and specialty clinicians, health system leaders, payers, IT, system design people, and policymakers, and really convened through meetings and webinars over about a year and a half to try to integrate the perspective of all of these groups. And we asked them the question, could you help us identify what are some of the modifiable contributors to fragmented, burdensome, potentially harmful care for older adults with multiple chronic conditions? And knowing what these factors are, can you help design what a feasible, sustainable approach to care might be that improves the care of this population um, by uh, focusing on these identified contributing factors. So again, this was not what patients want, it wasn't what clinicians wanted, it wasn't what payers wanted, it was bringing everybody to the table to identify what um, they all agreed on we should be focus on, focusing on. And we call this project CareAlign, or Care Realign, to try to realign care um, to focus on this population. And interestingly enough, there was an amazing amount of consensus among this really heterogeneous group of people on what, this, what three very common modifiable uh, factors are. Is that, not surprisingly, is that decision making and care is focused on disease specific, not patient based outcomes. If you, if you, if you, everybody does their care focused on a different outcome, if you're shooting your arrow at a different target, it's not surprising that fragmentation occurs. Second of all, and I suspect as clinicians you recognize this as well, is there's lack of delineation of roles and responsibilities and accountable. The way we practice medicine today, nobody's really in charge, right? The cardiologist takes care of the cardiovascular disease, endocrinologist, their part, primary care, sometimes is able to be the uh, quarterback, but often not. And this is as frustrating for the clinicians as it was for, for the patients. And again, finally, it was a lack of attention to what matters most to individuals, which is their own specific individual health priorities. 
So based on, on the input from this, from this really heterogeneous group of individuals and, and based on, on those contributing factors, we figured that a possible solution would be to bridge disease-based guideline decision-making and care with patient-based decision-making uh, and, and care. And so, again, you may not be able to read this, but I just wanted to sort of point out to you the population to whom this is most uh, referable. And again, is the first question you want to ask is, are disease-specific guidelines applicable to my patient? In the far, far um, left side there, people with a good life expectancy, have few conditions, and remain fit and functional. This group of people, whether they're 90 or whether they're 60 or whether they're 50, were probably in pretty good shape to follow disease-based guideline, again, bringing into account what individual patients' uh, preferences might be, which every single guideline uh, provides that caveat. On the far right-hand side are those individuals with very advanced disease, whether it's dementia, heart failure, or COPD, who are probably in the last one or two years of life. And certainly people at this institution, uh, Diane Meyer and, and Sean Morrison and others, who's really brought the world much of our understanding of how we should be treating that population um, with palliative care, symptom management, and increasingly recognition of de-escalation um, of, of therapy. So on the two extremes, we have a pretty good idea of what appropriate care is. It's that vast group of people in the middle for whom it's uncertainty. So I think the key operative word here is the uncertainty of, of disease-based guidelines, and can we, in this group, um, better align care with what matters most to them. And it doesn't matter if you can read this because I'm going to get to that in just a minute. And so based on that understanding, um, the group really focused on this middle group, which is probably about, about half, maybe a third to a half of older adults is that we're talking about here. So a sizable number of the patients that we take care of. And they felt that the appropriate care was what they called patient goal-directed care. And this is, means that patients outcome goals and care preferences should be elicited and shared, that clinicians should not just take a disease and translate it into care, but do the intermediate step of identifying which, which of the care that they have in their armamentarium, given the condition, is most likely to translate into better outcomes that matter to the individual. And it also means that primary and specialty care align with each patient's outcome. So rather than throwing arrows at different targets, everybody throws their arrow at the same target, which is the individual's own goals and preferences. Um, and again, a population for I, whom I think this is most appropriate, although I think it's appropriate for everybody, it's that 20 to 50, 25 to 50 percent of the population that's not yet at the end of life that has uncertainty of benefits of disease guideline care, that's facing trade-offs, that has multiple clinicians, and are starting to feel conflicting uh, recommendation across their providers and feel burdened with their care. So what do we mean by patient goals and care preferences? And the, out, the health outcome goals, again, are those personal outcomes that people want from their health care. They don't necessarily tell us that, but implicitly when they come to you for treatment of their hypertension or their heart failure, this is what they want you to help them with. It's the specific, measurable, actionable, reliable, and time-bound goals, smart goals, um, that are specific enough for us as clinicians to act upon. And it might be pain-controlled, uh, sufficiently that I can get five hours of sleep at night, or my shortness of breath under better enough control and my fatigue is better enough that I can walk at least a block to get to my granddaughter's house uh, twice a week. And again, these patient outcome goals are distinct from behavioral goals such as stopping smoking or disease goals such as improving blood pressure or hemoglobin A1C. And again, the other part of the equation, we sort of call this person-based uh, value with the numerator being the outcome goals that they want and the denominator being their care preferences or treatment is what is acceptable to them in terms of the activities they have to perform as a, as a patient to get the outcomes that matter most to them. And really personal value-based care is, includes both an understanding of what their outcomes are and what they're willing to do to get those outcomes. 
And to give you an example of what I'm talking about, again, the domains are, although it may seem complicated, oh my god, I have a thousand patients, if they each have a different outcome, how am I going to do that? It's really probably simpler than it appears on the surface because, again, as I said, most um, pr patients' priorities when faced with trade-offs really do come under longevity. I want to, no matter what condition I'm in, I want to live at least another five years so I can see my grandson graduate from high school. Or, I don't care how long I live um, or how I feel, but I at least want to get to be able to walk two blocks to get to the store so I can still do my own shopping. Or I don't care how long I live, but most important to me is relieve my symptoms so I can garden at least a half an hour a day. So again, it's, it really is a few buckets that most people's priorities um, can fall in. And, and similar, I think one of the things we need to start being cognizant of is what we're asking our patients to do and really be understanding what are the treatment burden and the care preferences, whether it's health utilization, number of visits, and this is getting more and more common as you know, people leave the hospital, they have to see their primary care doc within seven days, or you get nixed and their specialists within a short period of time. So we're really adding on more and more burden with uh, health care utilization, medication management, self-management tasks and, and procedures again. So just to kind of start thinking about both sides of the equation. So the group also helped us identify what would be some of the guiding principles uh, for um, patient goal-directed care. If we really sort of bridged disease-based, evidence-based care to, to patient goal-directed care. Again, is that patient goals and preferences should drive all care for this population. It's not the disease solely. The disease becomes the intermediary. Under disease-based care, Disease outcomes are the end and of themselves. In patient goal-directed care, it's the intermediate step. I improve this disease outcome only because it's going to improve the patient's ultimate goal. Um, and diseases and care gets integrated across conditions. Um, and so the disease is integrated not at the, uh, care is integrated not at the disease level, but at the patient level. This mean, requires a lot more true coordination among clinicians, and I think is frankly part of the biggest challenge, as you can see in that previous slide when I said the average uh, primary care uh, clinician interacts with, with over 200 individuals. This is, this is probably one of our biggest challenges, and I don't know about your institution, but um, at a lot of institutions, there's a recognition that we have to shrink the referral network so that we are not interacting with as many clinicians as we have been in the past. That has its own, that ha certainly has its own set of, of complications, but I think is a direction that we probably need to go in. The third principle is what we call current care planning. There's a lot of work and effort in advanced care planning, which is incredibly important. But these people are getting a lot of care now, so we really are focused on what people are getting today, their current care planning, that acknowledges, again, the first step is acknowledging the uncertainty. If we truly believe that all the disease-based guidelines um, provide only help and no harm for our patients, then, then um, it makes no sense to, to move towards patient goal-directed care. But I think most of us do recognize in that middle group, people with multiple chronic conditions, we've all seen it, where we're really not certain. Um, and we know from the evidence that we don't know if those disease guidelines provide the same benefit and lack of harm. Um, so first of all, acknowledging that uncertainty and then considering the trade-offs. And this is, it, it, you know, with it, each individual, the trade-offs across conditions can be very complex and it's time consuming but it's something we have to figure out how to do better than we do today. I think just thinking about the trade-offs may make us think differently in terms of our decision making. And the third thing we need to start doing is thinking about the magnitude of benefit on patients' outcome goals and not just their diseases. And the magnitude of benefit is particularly important in this population. If, for instance, if you take hypertension, we know that there's about a 25 to 30 percent reduction in, um, in strokes with good blood pressure control. Although, as, as probably those of you who read the SPRINT trial know, that they actually did not see, with, at least with a tighter control, uh, a decreased risk of, of stroke prevention. But overall, probably about a 25 percent reduction. But if you take a, take a I mean, 80-year-old, um, that probably means going from a risk of about 20 percent over five years to about 17 percent risk of stroke in about five years. So when you think about the absolute re 
risk reduction is the magnitude of benefit becomes very, very important. And sometimes the magnitude of benefit across all of the different treatments becomes relatively small. And I think it's something we need to think about as well. Is there enough benefit um, to, to warrant the greater complexity of care and potential for harm? So what are some of the key components if we were going to move to, um, to um, patient goal-based care? Obviously, it begins with eliciting patient health outcomes. And this requires a skilled, trained member of the healthcare team with the time to do it. And one of the resounding things that, that our patient colleagues did and this said, doctors are probably not the people to do it. Number one, they don't have the time. Number two, they don't have the patience. Number three, they don't have the communication skills. Um, I, I took a little offense at that, but um, they're probably not far off from wrong. Um, but anybody that has communication skills can be learned to do this. And one of the things people always say to me, but wait a second, people change their, all the, their mind all the time. I ask them on Monday what they want, and Tuesday they tell me something different. That is not SMART goals. And that's why it takes a skill trained individuals to work through people's general values, which by the way, don't change very much over time, to the SMART goals that inform decision making. And when it's really done in a, in a, um, by a really trained individuals and we come up with a specific measurable, actionable goals, then they actually are quite reliable until there's a true change in, in health system. And, and part of the work that we're doing with the funding from PCORI and the Hartford Foundation and RWJ is coming up with clinically feasible way to do this. The second thing we need to know is, again, is there acceptable um, workload or, or care burden? What are they willing and able to do to achieve their health outcome goals? And we need to, that needs to become, again, part of our dialogue. These are the five things that I, that I want you to do. Which are you willing and able to do? And again, if we really have that dialogue and negotiation, we're going to increase adherence and probably in, improve outcomes. And the third thing that, that needs to happen is, both clinicians and patients need to learn how to do this and how to interact in a very, very different way. And obviously, we need to reassess these goals over time, just like we reassess any other health out, any disease-specific outcome over time, because people do change as their health condition changes. So again, is we have to elicit the goals in a, in a clinically feasible but actionable way. And then the primary and specialty care needs to be aligned with these patient goals and preferences. And again, the things that the group told us we needed to do is, in the, is the clinicians need to agree on the roles and responsibility appropriate for each patient. And, and a lot of, and I don't know that you are an ACO, but, um, and there's a lot of AC, uh, increasing number of individuals that are either in integrated health systems or ACOs and compacts that were begun by the American College of Physicians, but others are doing them, are increasingly having compacts among clinicians to really articulate who's going to be responsible for what. It seems like a simple and obvious thing, somewhat complicated to do, but I think we're going to be moving in that direction more as we're moving more towards um, ACO-based care. Um, again, we need to learn how to translate outcome goals and preferences into care options, because right now we do it at the disease level. Um, and I think the way I sort of think about it is it really allows everybody to be what they're expert at. And I think this whole concept of shared decision making is providing people treatment options and pros and cons for, for treatment options is, is probably a nice intermediary step. But it, but it's, it's not really sustainable because, as, as we know, in indi each individual encounter, there are many different decisions that need to get made. And shared decision making around treatment options for each individual decision is really not feasible. What this really allows is patients to become the expert in what really matters most to them. They're the experts in the outcomes they want you to help them to get. You as the clinicians are the expert in the care options that are most likely to help you achieve these outcomes. So again, it allows us all to do what we know and do best. And so with this, the clinician's role becomes um, decision making, again, that, that doesn't just apply uh, in a, in a um, standard universal uh, fashion, disease-based evidence but it really bridges those evidence and goals with goals and preferences within the context of uncertainty, prognosis, competing outcomes, treatment complexity, and trade-offs. And it really, as I say, is a movement from, and you say this all the time, I'm sure everyone in this audience, including myself, has said in the last week to a patient, you need blank, 
for your blank, fill in the blank. You need an AICD because of your heart failure and ejection fraction. You need warfarin or, or uh, one of the newer anticoagulants for your atrial fibrillation. Fill in the blank. That's currently how we practice medicine. To move it to, there are really many different things that we could do, but now that I, I, but I suggest that we try, again, fill in the blank, knowing all your conditions, your overall health, and your own particular goals and preferences. So it's really a simple movement from disease to patient goal based decision making, which really actually simplifies things quite a bit because you become an expert in what care options you even need to offer. And again, we're doing this work with the American College of Physicians and the American College of Cardiology. We have a group of generalists, uh, uh, geriatricians and cardiologists who are helping us to develop um, these, uh, the, the training for this move to patient-based care. So getting, better, getting back to that individual group that I mentioned for you is, again, taking it through its logical step, current care planning flow for individuals with multiple chronic conditions, begins with asking the question, is this treatment that they currently on or you're thinking about offering them, is it likely to improve the specific measurable outcome goal that they find most important? If the answer is no, then we probably shouldn't be offering it. And if they're already on it, we should think about discontinuing it. If the answer is yes, then we need to think about, is it consistent with their care preferences? Is there something that they're willing and able to do? And if the initial response to that is no, then it's time to negotiate, because the patient either then needs to change their outcome goals to be commensurate with what they're willing to do, or they need to be willing to do something more to get the outcome that they want. And I would tell you is that that would probably drastically increase adherence if we did that negotiation. Um, the next step we want to have, again, is the willing to accept trade-offs. So the first things we need to do is recognize the trade-offs that we have to present to our patients to get the outcomes that they want. And again, if they're not originally willing, we need to feel comfortable in negotiating so that they understand explicitly and implicitly what their outcomes are going to get for, for what trade-off that they have to um, put up with. Um, and then we want to make sure, again, that, um, that, that if all of those are, are uh, met, then we need to treat as consistent with their goals and preferences and trade-off. And then we need to think periodically, review people's care and say, is there any current care that they're not getting that they're get currently getting that's not consistent with their goals. And if there are, this is our opportunity to stop some of the therapy, decrease the complexity, improve adherence, and probably uh, improve um, their outcomes. And again, there's much, much work done, increasingly done on de-escalating and de-prescribing um, care for this population. Um, and for um, the younger uh, budding patient-oriented um, researchers in the group, no matter what field you're in, this is really a, a, an area that's ripe for, for investigation. We're very, very good at adding treatments and adding medications. We're not very good at stopping them, and it's just as important to know what to stop as it is to know what to add. I think that's really an area ripe for investigation. So as we are beginning this work of preparing clinicians for moving from disease-based to goal-based care, um, we asked our, our primary care and cardiology colleagues from the American College of Physicians and American College of Cardiology, what is it that you need from us to help you to feel more comfortable and more competent in providing this type of care? First of all, they said loud and clear, no more guidelines, please. Um, but they, need, they wanted to have a way to have the conversation. They felt that they could do this. They felt they had a pretty good in, in, a sense of what, what different options might get the kind of outcomes that people cared about. But they didn't know how to have the conversations. They've been trained about the you need this for your that. They haven't been trained in the dialogue about knowing what's most important to you and everything that's happening in your life. This is what I suggest. And they really wanted us to help summarize, simplify, and condense a few guiding principles that transcend individual decisions. Because they wanted to get this away from all these individual decisions more to the, towards this, this approach to care. They also thought it was important to help them frame and communicate issues that were important. Again, is how do you frame uncertainty? Doctors don't like to say that they're not certain about the care. How do we communicate that without losing the confidence of, of, of our patients? 
um, again, is, is how do you really talk about benefit? Get away from the concept of you need, you need the warfarin or your anticoagulating to reduce your stroke to, well, if you don't have it, your risk of, of a stroke is this. If you do take it, your risk of a stroke is that, but your risk of a bleed is that. How do you get all those numbers and all that dialogue in a simplified way that people can understand and I have time to do in my practice? And again, how do you, how do you transmit um, and discuss trade-offs? And one of the things that we found is that's not gonna be a hard sell. Patients live the trade-offs. That one of the things that we found with regardless of what people's health literacy were, they understood the trade-offs. Um, so I think it, 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 they're looking for us to talk more about it. Interestingly enough, people were concerned that they didn't want to be perceived as giving up or rationing or abandoning. How do we communicate this that, that we're not rationing or abandoning or giving up on them? They also wanted to get advice on how do you de-escalate therapy that weren't meeting patient goals and preferences. And importantly enough, they need evidence of treatment effects on patient outcomes such as function and symptoms and not survival. And again, to the, the patient-oriented researchers in the audience, and, and I, as um, mentioned, I am on the methodology committee of, of PCORI, and one of the things we're moving towards is really requiring patient-reported outcomes in all of PCORI-funded uh, research, not just survival. We have to get beyond survival as the major primary outcome, and I think even the NIH is moving in that direction as well. But the other things they said, and I'm, not, I'm sure this is not going to shock this audience, is they didn't need just training and what to do. They needed to have cultural change and practice change that supported people doing it. And, and these are um, direct quotes from the cardiologists and primary care uh, people. Um, they said that things that needed to change. Right now, we live in a guideline-based culture, which values the physician, the clinician, um, teaching the patient so they understand what the best treatment is. My job is I know what's best for you and I have to help you to understand that. We needed to change that if we're going to move in this direction. Cardiologists also acknowledge that they think primarily in terms of survival, um, that they um, haven't figured out how to balance survival with other goals such as quality of life, function, and symptoms. So the cardiologists themselves recognize that that was something that they had to get better at. Um, they also um, um, acknowledge that it's nice that, that this is what matters most to patients, but really matters to us is what our peers think. And if I'm not following the guidelines, I'm going to be perceived as not a very good clinician. So again, that culture needed to change. And universally, they said, right now we're getting measured on disease uh, quality metrics. Did my heart failure patient get readmitted? Did I meet blood pressure goals? Did I meet hemoglobin A1C goals? And we need quality metrics that align with this care. And, and the good news is that even the legislature, if they can agree on anything, um, is, um, is, is actually in their new um, thing that they just reported out on chronic care management, specifically identified patient-centered quality metrics as something that's an area of investigation. So again, those of you who are into quality metrics, uh, an area of ripe um, opportunity to, to give us better what, we, what I call quality metrics 2.0. We need to get rid of all these individual disease-based metrics, which I think really brought us along very, very well. We now need to move towards a smaller number of patient metrics that transcend disease. So finally, to wrapping up, what are some of the unique, and I put this in quotes because obviously a lot of care models include some of these, but what are some of the unique features of Caroline or patient goal-based care? Number one, it bridges disease-based guideline care with patient goals and preferences. So it's not either or, it's how do you actually apply it within the context of individual patients and when do you identify that it's relevant and not relevant. Again, it's current care planning. It's not accepting the status quo. And I know I just got to finish a tent, excuse me, finished a month attending on our um, uh, acute uh, units at Yale, at Yale New Haven, and um, our patients come and go, and the, and the um, residents always present the new patient with all the 27 uh, things, and they talk about one thing, and they talk about, and we continue all the home regimen. And this sort of gets carried on over and over and over again, and when you ask them, most of them don't know why individual is on the medication. We call their primary care doc. They don't know. Patient's been on it forever. So we need to start looking at the current care and, again, sort of rethinking it. Again, we need to be able to translate the specific and actionable outcome goals into clinical care. 
Um, we need to, dec I think the advantage of this, I think it really is, and perhaps the only way that we're really going to decrease the complexity if everyone focuses on the same thing. And this was actually one of the cardiologists who said to us in one of our big groups, he said, well, if you're going to get everybody to focus on the same thing, what else would you focus on except for the outcome and what mattered most to the, most to the patients? And again, I, this is really appropriate care for everybody, although I think this is the population, the, 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 the ones with multiple chronic condition for, for whom care is currently uncertain and burdensome, but I think it's appropriate across the health spectrum. And again, some of our next steps as we try to move this out into the clinical arena, we are in the process of developing training uh, in this for both patients and for clinicians. Um, really trying to take advantage of a health information technology, um, working with how do you get patient goals and care preferences incorporated in a, in a very simple fashion so all clinicians can access it in an easy way. We're moving towards patient goal um, based um, referrals. So when, when somebody sent, you know, when a primary care doc sends a referral to a nephrologist, they're not going to just say, you know, their, their uh, uh, GFR is down to 40%. Uh, what do you think is, is really to say, this patient's goals and preferences are, are such and such. Um, what, what kind of care do you have that might improve um, their function, which is their primary goal? And hopefully this will also move much more towards, as we move more towards e-consults, I think this will be a very helpful use of information technology. We are beginning to pilot the feasibility of this in a large group practice in, uh, in the Connecticut area to see is it feasible and do we begin to have some effect on healthcare utilization, on health outcomes, and on patient and clinician satisfaction. And we're also heightening awareness. We actually have hired a communication firm to help us with this because, again, this is a different way of, of thinking for both clinicians and for patients, and we need to uh, see if people are interested in doing this and what it's going to take to uh, get it to, to move into practice more and more. So I want to end with going back to Mr. T, um, who I started the, with, and as you can see with his current uh, base care, we have all the specific and appropriate disease-based outcomes that each one of his care providers are interested in. As we move to goal-based care, we now identify, he's able to say what's most important to him, I want fewer symptoms, I want my fatigue to be improved, um, and I want my appetite to be better. It's more important to me to have fewer symptoms and better function now. Life prolongation is not um, a, a goal priority for me. He wants fewer visits, labs, medications, and clinicians and procedures, and he's willing to give up some of his disease-based outcomes to get there. Um, he now goes to multiple different uh, care providers, and I think we can reduce that number to his primary care provider and probably his cardiologist, not his nephrologist, and hopefully more, more of the interactions will happen by e-consult. I think we can decrease his number of visits to about 20 a month, which he currently has, to about five a month with no blood draws if, he's, if, if um, continuing warfarin is not a priority for him. Uh, we can definitely decrease his number of medications, um, which will probably include, improve some of the symptoms that he has um, that's most important for him. We can simplify his self-management tasks and avoid procedures, which he really says is, is not a priority for him. And so finally, I think this amount of care has a lot of challenges. Um, as, as we move, um, disease-based care has been incredibly successful, and it's not going to go away, um, but it's going to be difficult to um, move from solely disease-based care to disease-based care being an intermediary towards what really matters, which is their own outcome. But it, um, there's, again, is, there's no culture for this currently, but I think the uh, financial incentives and quality metric incentives as we move more towards value-based and away from uh, traditional fee-for-service and volume-based care. I think there will be an infrastructure that allow this to happen. There currently is a lack of evidence for translating goals into care decision-making, but if you really read um, good um, randomized control trials and observational studies, there is an emerging evidence base that really does look at these outcomes that matter to individuals. Um, and again, the financial incentives, although they're moving in that direction, are, are many more. But many, many challenges. But um, as what I found on the internet, good, good old Google search, 
um, from Eastern philosophy, running away from any problem only increases the distance from the solution. So the easiest way to escape the problem is to solve it. So hopefully um, the young clinicians and researchers in the room will find this as a challenge if they identify what they're interested in studying. Um, I think it's one of, as I started, it's one of the major challenges in healthcare today is taking appropriate care of this population, but I think it can be entirely rewarding as we figure out how to do it better. And with that, I thank you for inviting me to be here. about asking patients uh, whether they would prefer to fall and have disability versus improvement uh, with medication and fewer cardiovascular problems. Were the patients just asked uh, from the beginning what your preferences are or was there a discussion first about what it means to have these different disabilities? Was there a discussion about what kind of burden they might be placing upon the family? Was there a discussion about cost? Did they understand that they could change their mind later because they now developed a new set of goals? Yeah, no, those are all, um, those are all great questions. Um, and, and again, we didn't change any of their care. Um, these, these were just asked. In, um, what they were interested in. We framed it in terms of, first of all, the outcomes that we selected, we specifically selected the outcomes of stroke MI and the serious fall injuries. We, we described the serious fall injuries in a way that the amount of disability um, and the mortality were pretty comparable between the MI and the stroke and the hip fracture and, and the traumatic brain injury, which are the major um, serious fall injury. So the disability was pretty comparable between the two. We did not get into costs and a lot of, of other things. We just asked them right now, what is your preference? Because again, we were just really interested in the beginning to understand what people uh, understood when they're faced with the trade-offs. And again, we framed it in a way that did not give pri preference or priority to either outcome. But I think the major thing is that, that I learned from that event, I think it's really kind of dumb that we ask people, would you rather have a, a hip fracture or a stroke? Because obviously, they don't want to have either, which to me, I think the take home message, it really kind of convinced me that we have to stop thinking about these, all these sorts of things. And we have to think really about um, the outcomes that really matter to people. Again, the function, because I think that would get at your question. If we really got a sense of what people's um, likely function is given their condition and given the treatments that we have them, I think we can, you know, I think we can have a common metric across conditions and I think we can give better advice to our, our patients. Okay. Mary, Me Medicare is paying for a chronic care management fee, um, uh, about 40 to 50 bucks per month. Uh, what, what makes you think that that's going to work given the lack of evidence for chronic care management in the large Medicare trials of care coordination? What, what, what do I think that the, the, um, the current care, um, care management um, fee? Yeah. So not, not, not necessarily patient goal-directed care. You're just talking about care management. I, I, um, I think will help a little bit for, for some people. I think for those who are already sort of vested in, I think frankly what it's gonna do, it's gonna cover costs for what people have been eating for a long period of time. I don't think it's enough. It's $41, I think, a month. Um, it's probably not gonna be a, a game changer for somebody else. And my whole point here is I don't think you, can, you cannot coordinate yourself out of the current care. You can't. I mean, it's, it's, if you're just coordinating care as usual, um, my, my guess is the likelihood you're going to cause as much harm is good because I frankly think sometimes people not getting, you know, not taking a lot of the care that they've been prescribed is probably helping them as much as hurting them. So I don't think that if we, unless, unless we can really figure out for these people with multiple chronic condition, what set of care options and treatments really gets them benefit with minimal harm, I don't think all the care coordination um, is, is going to make a much difference. Thank you, Dr. Jenny, for talking.